Welcome once again to our seminar on spiritual warfare. Today we're going to be talking about the weapons of our warfare. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 17, that we do not uh, fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. So in this war of words, in this war of arguments, in this courtroom where the accuser of the brethren is bringing up accusations to defeat us, to disarm us, to, uh, uh, to neutralize us in this warfare, we must learn how to use these spiritual weapons. The, the Bible makes it very clear that these weapons are not the kinds of weapons we would normally use in a warfare here on the earth. We use tanks and bombs and missiles and, and guns and oh, knives. We use even yelling. <laughs> we use a lot of those kind of carnal weapons here on the earth. But this is against a spiritual foe. So we must use spiritual weapons. And these weapons sometimes are very contrary to our nature. As we think about warfare, we think about getting angry at the enemy. But, we, but in this warfare against the enemy of our souls, the devil, we must use the ones that God has given us. They are effective. The first one I want to mention, and there are a number of them, there's 12 I'm going to be talking about in this seminar. But the first one, and it is so important, is the Word of God. The Word of God is not only part of our, um, our weapons, but is also part of our armor, as we see in Ephesians 6, 17. It's for defense as well as offense. Well, now I'm going to talk about the offensive use of this sword of the Spirit. This sword, which is the Word of God, uh, is to come out of our mouth. It's not just to be placed and to carry around in our in our uh, bag or uh, under our arm. I remember one time a lady came to me, she was having nightmares at night, and, and she says, you know, Pastor, what I'm going to do? I'm going to put the Word of God under my pillow so that it will get rid of these, uh, <laughs> of these nightmares, these, uh, these tormenting spirits that bother her in the night. I just said, no, the Word of God is not just to be placed on your mantle or placed on the, your bedside table or under your pillow. It is to be used, it is to be placed into your heart and then spoken out with your mouth. The picture of the resurrected, victorious champion of champions, Jesus, in the book of Revelations, we see him with a two-edged sword, which is the Word of God coming out of his mouth. This is not something that we would, you know, just shake at the enemy like this and just say, you see, you see, it's here, it's here. No, no, it has to come out of our mouth. It has to be in our hearts and come out of our mouth. This is the, the good fight of faith. Faith is hearing the word of God. That's how faith comes. It is believing in our heart and it's speaking out with our mouth. So we hear with our ears, it comes in, we believe it, we speak it out and obey. See, this is the principle of faith. It's the word of faith that we speak, what we preach. And this is what annuls the very uh, demonic strongholds, uh, tears down those fortresses. It sets the captive free. Even in dealing with another layer of warfare in which you're praying for nations or you're coming in to, and you want to confront the principalities or powers over a certain area of land, a uh, nation, or even your neighborhood. You don't just come against them in your own name, in your own way, in your own will. You have to place the Word of God out there because then they deal with that. The Word of God is our argument. The Word of God is what we um, what we uh, use in this warfare. Even Jesus, when he was tempted, he did not just respond of his own initiative. He
he began each confrontation with the enemy this way, it is written. In other words, he was quoting scriptures. He was quoting what the word of God says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And that shut up the enemy. He could not, he didn't have an argument against that because it was written. Remember, this is a court of law. This is legality. This has to do with arguments. And when you place the argument on God's side and say, no, God said, now that's law. When God says something, it's law. And so it, it, it trumps anything that the enemy might bring against you. He may bring condemnation, but you say, but the word of God said, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You know, when he, when he comes against you with all kinds of symptoms and sickness, you have to say, but the word of God said by his stripes, I am healed. See, this is, we use the word of God to come against the very arguments and attacks of the enemy. The word of God is, um, is true and Satan is a liar. He, the word of God is not just true sometimes or in part of it, it's always true. If the word of God were only partially true, then it's never true. That's just how it works. Truth is absolute. It cannot be relative. If it's relative, it's only opinion. It's on the same level as opinion. Everyone has their own opinion, but the word of God is what is true. And when you speak out the word of God, that sets a, sets a standard. It sets the, the, the it levels the playing field. It just says, Satan, what you're saying has no basis because the word of God says this. Now, the, the scriptures in the Greek, especially, it uh, uses two words to describe the word of God. The first one is logos. And this is a general term. It, it is a, the general revelation of God. Uh, this word is seen in John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the word. That word there is logos. And in verse 14, it says, and that word logos became flesh and dwelt among us. And so Jesus is the logos, okay? He's the, he's the word of God, okay? And uh, the word incarnate made flesh. So that's the general. So when you receive the word of God, when you receive Jesus into your life, you have the Logos. When you read the, the, the Bible, you're reading the Logos. You're receiving the word into your heart. But that faith that uh, is used in this uh, warfare, this word of faith, this word of the spirit, this uh, two-edged sword, is when the Holy Spirit takes what is in you of the Logos and you speak it out. It inspires it and you speak it out. That's another word. And that word is rhema. The rhema is the spoken word or the inspired word. It has unction. It has anointing. And when it is spoken, it becomes that word of faith. Uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's that Rhema. And when we speak the word of God, uh, not just general knowledge of the word, not just talking about Jesus, but when we speak out that what the Holy Spirit inspires us at that moment, it uh, has a, a powerful effect. It is the rhema. It is the spoken word of God. All of creation was spoken into existence. Um, and, it, uh, and that's the word of God that is spoken that creates uh, a, a, a uh, effect in the spiritual realm as well as in the natural. Satan, as a liar from the beginning, will try to distort the word. He'll try to use the logos his own way. And that's what he did with Jesus. He even quoted scripture. You know, he quoted the Logos. He knew the Logos, but the but Jesus came back with the rhema, <laughs> with the sword of the Spirit, and was able to destroy that argument that he rose, that he rose up against. So never, um, so never diminish the importance of you speaking the Word of God. 
The Bible says that the word of God never returns void. In other words, it never stops working once it is spoken out. It's there to accomplish. The Holy Spirit is looking, is, is kind of hovering over uh, the word to perform it. Uh, when you speak it out, he takes over from there. Our responsibility is just to speak. His responsibility is to perform. And so as we speak out what he gives us, what he enlightens us, what he, what he uh, puts in our heart, it becomes a mighty weapon of the Lord. So this is a, uh, uh, just kind of a short little synapse into the importance of the word of God, using the word of God. Don't use your own intellect. Don't try to be smarter than you are, you know, or smarter than Satan. Just use the word of God. And that is what tears down his arguments. The second uh, the one I want to mention of these weapons is that of righteousness. Righteousness is being right before God. It is something that, that we don't earn. It is something given to us. In Romans uh, 5, uh, 17, says that we're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He gave us, he made us righteous. We didn't, be, we didn't earn it. We didn't do it. So this righteousness, and, and as we yield, and we talked about this the other day, as we yield our members as instruments, or that word there is weapons, weapons of righteousness, and this is in Romans 6, uh, 13, as we yield our members as instruments or weapons of righteousness, then we can destroy the very arguments of the enemy. He, does have, he has no arguments against righteous people, against righteous living. So, these, uh, so yield yourself. It is so important that we live right, that we do not play around with sin, that we do not allow our members, the, our body, our mind, our, what's, uh, uh, you know, our natural self to be slaves to sin, because that causes us to be under the very power of sin and to be defeated by the enemy. But as we are righteous and live in that righteousness, in that holiness before God, just that is a, is a weapon. Just being holy is a weapon. Just avoiding sin is a weapon. Just doing good is a weapon. Something that... Um, we see in, uh, in uh, Hebrews 10, it says, that, it says that Jesus went about doing good, now, healing all those who are oppressed by the devil. In other words, just he went around just doing good, just, just doing righteous things. And that was an enemy. And people were healed. People were encouraged. And the enemy was defeated. His oppressive nature was nullified, was, was uh, uh, canceled. And we can do this through our righteousness. The next one I want to talk about is the area of peace. Sometimes we don't think that peace is really a weapon. You know, we think it's a compromise, but it isn't compromise. It's an actual weapon. In Romans chapter 16, right at the very end, of that, of that book of Romans. It says this in verse 20. It says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Can you imagine? <laughs> what a contradiction. It seems like that anyway. The God of peace will crush Satan <laughs> under your feet. And so this peace is a weapon in our hands. As we walk in peace, we put, this is the gospel of peace. We're to go in, in Luke chapter 10. He sent out the 72 and he says, go to villages. And when you come to a home, you speak peace over it. That's how you're to approach people that are bound by the enemy. And then you go in, you, you, you eat a meal with them, you bless them, you pray for the sick. And then you say the kingdom of God has come. But the first thing is to, to declare peace. When Jesus was in the storm, uh, and he and the and the uh, the fishermen disciples that should know how to handle a storm, how to handle a boat in in that kind of weather. 
But Jesus was at peace. He was sleeping. And when they said, Master, Master, we're about to die. Help us. He woke up and he rebuked the storm by saying, Peace be to you. Peace is a weapon. It destroys the storms that, the, that Satan would uh, wage against you. He tries to take your peace because he knows by taking your peace, he can come in and steal many other things. So you need to guard your peace. You need to walk in peace. You need to live in peace. That is that shalom. <laughs> he is the God of peace. That's one of his names. Jehovah Shalom. The Lord our peace. So I just want to leave you with those three weapons, powerful weapons that we have in Christ Jesus. Thank you.